Great leaders create the environment where people feel comfortable to give their ideas all the time. Do not present a strategy or an idea as complete if you want engagement from your team. Leave at least 5% unfinished and ask them, how would you fill it in? A, you'll get ideas, but B, you'll get ownership. Even if you've pretty certain you've got a clear idea in your head, still leave space for that engagement. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Relentless Pursuit of Winning podcast. My name is Rick Meekins. I'm going to be your host today. And in the studio, we have my friend Ferris Ar- Aranke. That's <laughs> Am correct, I saying Rick. it correctly? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> man, it's, it's good to see you, man. Uh, we've been trying to, so folks, we've been trying to get this uh, interview scheduled for weeks. And let's just blame, I don't know, <laughs> something else uh, that we couldn't get it done. But we're here today, and I'm, I'm really excited to have this conversation. All right, again, it's good to see you, man. How have things oh, been? Pleasure, pleasure's all mine, Rick. Pleasure's all mine. And uh, I tell you what, I don't like to say this, but the listeners are in for a treat. That's what I'm thinking. That's exactly what I'm thinking. You know what? Let's do this. Let's give them a little bit of background about who you are, what you do, and why you do it. Okay. Uh, that's where I love studying. So who am I? I'm Farah Sarenki. Uh I'm uh, here in London, uh, UK, if you don't know where London is. And uh, I run a little company called Shia Ghetto. You can see a pillow over my shoulder for those of you watching the footage. Uh, that's the name of the company. It's the Japanese word for a sharpening stone. Okay. If you've ever had a knife go dull, you may have used a, a Shia Ghetto to sharpen it. Now, that's a clue to what I do. All right. Me and my company, we help sharpen other companies. We make people and strategies more effective because often they go a little bit dull. Right, all of us, if we're honest, we're not as sharp as we think we could be. Right, and it's the same for your company. Uh, you know, so we go in and we help leaders be better leaders. We help strategies be better strategies. Right, and we do that through a certain methodology. But the reason I love doing that is it makes such a difference for people's lives. It makes such a forget the company. It makes a difference for the people in that company. They enjoy it more. They're more collaborative. They get better ideas. So uh, making that impact. It's a huge, uh, you know, high for us, for me and the team. And actually, it takes me back to my first career, which was as a school teacher. You know, I used to teach high school math and economics. And that moment you got a student, a kid, to understand something for the first time, you knew their life would be different. And, you'd, you know, you'd walk away with this warm glow. That's the kind of warm glow I get in my job today. I love it. I love it. I love it. And it's like, you know, you, you think about the I, – I hear these stories, you know, about people going through, especially leaders – you know, going through all the challenges and, you know, carry the huge weight of, you know, running these companies, growing these companies. I mean, it's, it's a bear, you know what I'm saying? And you guys come in and, and you guys work your magic and, and just um, give a new perspective, I guess. I know, I know we talked a little bit about uh, emotional intelligence. That's a big part of what you're doing. Can you go into that just a little bit and how that impacts folks? Absolutely. Right. So, you know, I said I said kind of big level what we do, but how do we go about it? We work across three pillars, really, with individuals and teams and companies. And we say to be successful in life, you need a great combination of IQ, EQ, and FQ, right? So let me just unpack each of those. IQ isn't your Mensa score, right? is isn't your sort of uh, that. It's your ability to come up with great ideas, all right? And that could be from you or from leveraging your team, right? Great ideas don't just have to come from an individual. They come from a group. But if you don't ask the group, if you don't engage them, if you don't stress test them, you know, push them, frame it, you're not going to get good answers. So that's the IQ part. Have you got the best kind of answers to the, whatever the problem facing you? The next part of the EQ is if you've got the great solution, right, the great answer, it's not enough, right? You need the emotional intelligence to take others with you because otherwise you're going alone or it's just a piece of paper. It's just an idea. So great teams, great leaders have lots of emotional intelligence and that's where we help and the third part is it's still not enough to have a great idea and people on the journey with you. You need to have focus. Right? What separates the good companies from the great companies, in my experience, is that focus, that ability to say, nope, these are the three things we need to work on. Let's get it done. Right? Remove the barriers in the way of those three things. But too many companies overload what they ask of their teams. They then have all these little barriers in the way that stop the team from actually giving it its full focus. So... IQ, EQ, and FQ is the winning formula. Wow, wow, wow! That's that's uh, that's that's brilliant. Um, I, I just think I was thinking while you were talking, I was just thinking about you know the number of ideas or innovations you know that kind of get left on the table. You know, especially from folks that are you know doing the work. 
you know what I'm saying? They're they're looking at, you know, whatever it is they're doing. It's like, hey, we can do this differently, better, or we can develop this 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 new thing. How do you how do you make sure that people are getting a voice? You know, I mean, it's one thing to have that idea, but to really get that articulated to the leadership. You know, sometimes it's courage. You know, sometimes it's somebody has to step out of their comfort zone and say, hey, we can do this better. I mean, how, how do you guys accomplish that? I mean, if you're relying on somebody stepping outside their comfort zone to give you some, uh, give you an idea, then you're in a bad place is what I say. Uh, great leaders create the environment where people feel comfortable to give their ideas all the time, right? So step number one, I tell all leaders, do not present a, a strategy or an idea is complete if you want engagement from your team, right? Leave at least 5% unfinished and ask them, how would you fill it in, right? Suddenly, A, you'll get ideas, but B, you'll get ownership. Whereas if you just drop, go, hey guys, this is what we're doing from now on, right? There's going to be less engagement. So step number one, leave space for the ideas, right? Even if you're pretty certain you've got a clear idea in your head, still leave space for that engagement. Step number two, don't just ask people to shout out. Don't don't rely on them to step forward because all you'll get is ideas from the most extroverted, confident people, which is great, but they might they might be terrible ideas. Right? <laughs> just because I just because I'm confident doesn't mean I have a great answer. But we often confuse those two. Oh well, that guy stood up. He must know what he's talking about. No, that guy just you know he might be dead by his friend. He might be bored. He might be right. So create the environment that people can give you their ideas however they feel safe. Now, that might be stick an ideas box up. It might be make yourself available. Say, look, I'm going to have a, a drop-in session once a week, once a month, where I'll just be sat here. If you want to come and talk to me, just come and talk to me. Or it might be one of the most effective things I do in teams is I love the idea generation phase, right? But what I say to teams is I don't want you to shout out, right? I'm going to, I'm going to give you a topic. I want you each to write your best ideas, and then I want you to submit them to me. And what we're going to do is I'm going to take your names off it and I'm going to read out all the ideas or I'm going to recirculate all the ideas. That way you're not you're not influenced by who gave generated the idea. You just judge it on the quality of the idea. Right? And it forces you all to submit something. And this this revolutionizes teams. Ben? Yeah, I, I love that approach. That uh, reminds me of uh, like a almost like a like a Kaizen session. Yeah. You yeah, know, very you get much. All the so. ideas, like you get people just you know, really brainstorming. So are you suggesting like, uh, take that approach? You've got all these ideas that are coming out from, well, let me, let me back up from that. Um, when you're talking about a scenario like that, are you talking about, you know, solving a specific problem? Or are you talking about, you know, let's go from raw? I generally talking about solve a specific problem, right? Give people a lightning rod, a focus to where they should generate their ideas. I mean, it's great if they just get ideas generally, but if you want, you know, I show teams how in, in you know, I've got a little game that I do with people. In one minute, if you give me 10 individuals in one minute, I will guarantee you I can get 50 unique ideas out of them. All right? That's all I need, right? But it's uh, by being specific, by, by running a technique, uh, and that's great. Imagine getting suddenly 50 fresh ideas on any topic, like how do we save cost, right? Or how do we get more customers or how to... You know, and it doesn't have to be as big as that. It could just be, you know, how do we run this team meeting better? All right. Uh, so give them a specific challenge. It puts the focus on, right? It's that FQ, right? But then create the environment using EQ to generate as much ideas, which feeds into the IQ. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I take it you're just kind of like from there, we've got 50 ideas. We're kind of trying to narrow that down, group things together and, and come yeah. up with uh, some specific initiatives from there. Yeah, you all, you know, I, I'll always say to people, it's better to have a hundred ideas if you need to pick one than to have only two ideas and then pick one, right? Because oh, yeah. because a he you might not have all the best ideas, but b what if your first idea fails? If you've come up with a hundred originally, you've got ninety nine others that you can then slot in place and say, okay, well that one didn't work, let's try this one. Uh -uh. Yeah, okay. what a great place to be. Yeah, 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 hundred percent, hundred percent. So, so from there, I mean, we've, we've got some ideas, we've got, uh, you know, boiled down to some initiatives. How does the, how does the EQ, how does the emotional intelligence, um, come into play at that point? So, uh, when, when you've got the ideas on the table, all right, then great EQ is let's all decide together, um, how we're going to, how, you know, which idea we, um, should take forward. Now, when I say let's all decide together, it's not 
doesn't have to be one person, one vote, right? Okay, it, this could be where the boss steps in. But the EQ is the ability to 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 make people feel like they're engaged, to make people feel that, you know, they still own this, right? So even if you, and a lot of the EQ that I, I teach leaders or talk about is the ability to flex the style, your style, right? So some people in that room will need a lot of logic from you, right? Yeah, take each idea, explain the logic, the facts behind it, right? Other people will just need you to tell them which is the idea you, you're going to pick, right? The third group of people want to be engaged. They want to be part of the ones shaping it. Uh, and the fourth group want to, to be told an amazing story. You know? Give them a vision of why this idea is the best idea out of the bunch. Uh, and the key to being a great leader is giving each of those groups of individuals what they need so they, they feel comfortable. And that's where emotional intelligence comes in. Too many people just have one style and they go, well, this will do. I'll just tell you. And that's great. Half the room will be happy. The other half will be like, that didn't really work for me, but they won't say it. That's the thing. But they will resist, right? They won't be as bought in as the other half of the room. So so that's where they, that's what I tell leaders a lot about where emotional intelligence comes in. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, so it sounds to me like um, either the leader or the team members have to go through some sort of um, development because, I mean, obviously we can't, you know, walk in the room and, I mean, unless, you know, we're very intimate, but, you know, can't walk in the room and say, okay, you're, you know, this type of person, you're this type of person, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we've yeah. got to give them some background, you know, and I, th I think you could even say like empower them, you know, it's like, hey, this is your superpower. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, t t tell me, tell me about you know your approach to that, or yeah, I mean, a lot of it comes from getting to know your your team members, right, and it, and getting to know each other. Um, so you could do that in one on ones, you can do that in group settings, but the more you know about each other, uh, the easier it will be to work to to understand what you need from me, what what I need from you, uh, and you, and there's lots of different ways to do that, right? I do with teams s silly fun things like. You know, uh, let's uh, let's all yeah, let's all. I'll put people in pairs and say you've got to find one fact that connects the two of you, right? So instantly they're learning something about the other person while also learning some of the other things about them. Uh, or we'll we'll play a game like let's guess how many kids we all have. Let's let's uh, right or and you know the other end of the spectrum is more formalized sort of. I'm going to give you ten statements I need you to fill in, you know, uh, which explain your personality type, and then we're going to share those around the group, you know. Because the more the quicker you can understand that is you the quicker you get through what I call the um, forming, storming, norming, performing curve. If you've ever heard of that, Rick, right? Which for those who haven't heard is is the evolution of a team. Whenever they come together, they form, as in they all very nice and polite. They then have arguments when they can't hold in their opinions anymore. Then they reach a point where they normalize and they go, okay, this is what I need from you. This is what you need from me. They make agreements, and that's when performance takes off. So the quicker you can get to that norming stage and right that's what great leaders do and should be doing that's awesome that's awesome um side topic um storming phase yeah. um how do you make that like extremely productive because i mean in the storming phase you, you know we're, we're not you know like you said we're not being polite anymore you know we're really <laughs> you know speaking our minds saying exactly what we think how, how do we get the most energy um out of you know that that scenario uh, it's like, it's, uh, you know what? Every team has to go through the storming phase. And I would say, bring it sooner and get through it quicker, right? Your productivity during that phase isn't the highest, let's be honest, right? So try and shorten the time you're in that phase. So make it fun. Make it uh, acceptable to say, okay, now we're going to... And it's very similar to something I do, which is called a pre-mortem with, with companies, right? Which is bringing fun to negative ideas, right? A pre-mortem is... Let's take your idea, let's take your strategy and let's destroy it. Let's assume it is the worst idea in the world, but let's have fun with it. Let's come up with all the wacky ways that it might be the worst idea, that it might fail, right? And celebrate each of those ideas. So it's the same when I get a team together and I want them to storm, I said, let's just get out the things that irritate us. Don't put it, you know, you don't have to say it's because of this person. You might just say, look, I hate when people send me emails after 10 p.m. You don't have to say, I hate when John sends me. Right. And I said, the, the more ludicrous, the better. Right. And you, you, when I do this with teams, you'll get stuff that you never even thought of. I hate when people eat apples next to me. I hate when people, you know, force me to listen to their stories about their dog. I hate when, right. And you're like, 
brilliant. Sounds right? very person. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because this is how real humans think, right? So it's better better that they share it than bottle it up, right? Because yeah, and uh, you know, and then you can have fun. You can make a top ten list of it. You can go, which one do we think is the, the strangest? Which one do we right? Um, and again, if it's a hint of embarrassment, do it in do it in a way that you don't reveal who who gave that um, gave that uh, sort of contribution, right? So you, there's lots yeah. of tools to do this anonymously. But yeah. it's better to get it out than to keep it bottled. Yeah, yeah. It's it sounds I mean, it sounds very important. I mean, when you think about it, because you know, you move into the norming stage and you've got people we don't what we don't want to do, um, is we don't want people walking around on eggshells. You know, it's like, oh well, you know, I don't wanna, you know, eat apples next to this guy or whatever. <laughs> um <laughs> but you know, it it um I th- I, it sounds as though it would allow the team to really get into that that performing stage um, very effectively, you know, and, and we're getting more of the voices, you know. Yeah. I, so back to back to uh, we talked about different personality types. How do we how do, how do we get the more extroverted, the more um, I guess A type personalities to be empathetic towards those that are tend to be you know the um, you know, our foundational people, if you will. Yeah. Um, well, there's, there's a, there's a couple of ways, right? Um, so first of all, it's always great if you meet an individual who wants to self-develop. Okay. Cause then you can work with them and say, you know, this is your behavior. This is the impact it's having. So yes, you're extroverted, but actually you're talking over people. Are you aware? So if they, if they actually want to develop, you can help them. And the first step is, point out the number of times it's like I, w- I working with someone recently who I've, at the end of a meeting a two-hour meeting i said to him how do you think that went and he went i think it went amazing and i said really i thought it went terribly uh and i'll tell you why i said to him here's a question for you how much do you think you spoke versus the rest of the people in the room and there was like eight people in the room who said i probably spoke 10 percent of the time and the great thing is we could replay the tape and you know using some of the modern ai it spat out exactly how much he took he talked for 70 percent of the meeting Right, but he was completely unaware. He thought it was only ten percent. So by showing him the data was the first step, buddy. You are way off where you think you are. Right. So and then giving him some techniques on how to rein himself in. Right. But that's only category A people, those who want to develop. Then there's category B people who don't give a damn. They're like, I'm an extrovert. I like talking over people. So sue me. Right. Okay. Fair enough. Then you just have to change the process around those people. Right. Is and what I mean by that is. Uh, I've, I've been known in meetings, if you've got people who are long talkers, say, okay, from now on, any time you are talking in this meeting, you have to be holding a squat or holding a plank exercise. Do you know what? That shuts them up a lot, right? They get their point across a lot sooner and they talk less, right? Um, and you say, well, this rule applies to everyone, right? So if you want to talk, this is what you've got to do. So that guy who was 70% of the meeting, I bet you he can't hold a plank for 70% of the meeting, right? He'll soon only talk for 15% of the meeting. Right. Or you give everyone like a credit and you and you, you sort of, you know, you use techniques. So there's lots of little innovate, you know, fun ways to engage the team, make it a team and explain the rules to the team um, that can change the dynamic without the person having to go on a journey of self-exploratory exploration and, and changing their behavior. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. I love that. I love that. Um, let's get a little deeper into, into FQ. OK. Um, I mean, I love FQ. It sounds like a rude word, but it's not. Um, <laughs> right, just... Q. <laughs> FQ. No, FQ. <laughs> um, and most people have never heard of it, right? But uh, the way I describe it to people is, let's imagine, uh, well, first of all, at a, at a, at a, uh, let's imagine the individual, right? Let's imagine, Rick, you tell me you've got a really important task to do today. I say, great, right? And you say, well, look, it's the most important thing I've got to do. So I'm going to give it my full focus. Now, what happens in reality is you sit down, whatever you've got to do. Before you start, you might check your phone. You might do whatever. You already lost 10% of your focus, right? Let's imagine you have 100 points of focus. You lose 10%. Yeah? While you're working away or whatever, somebody interrupts you, right? So your brain goes over there. You stop and you you just do, you know, do a quick bit of work for your boss. Suddenly, you've lost another 20%, right? But here's what else that happens to you during that day. Let's say you need to print something out, but your printer's not working. You lose an hour to trying to fix the printer. There goes another 30 points of your focus. Then suddenly you get hungry. Where does your brain go? 
he goes on to, oh, what shall I have for lunch? Right. So again, you're not focused on your task. All these things, life is set up to to rob us of focus and distraction and, and put distractions. Now, if you really thought about it and said, this is the most important thing in my task, you'd lock the door, you'd, you'd take out all those barriers. You would pre-prepare for all those things you saw that were coming down the road, like your hunger. You would have a sandwich already made, right? So you don't have to lose half an hour to making food. You, you know, if other things that distract our brain, if the room's too cold, right? If something else is going on. So just eliminate all those distractions before you focus on the task that you said is really important. So that's that's a big one around individuals focus. But I said before, the biggest thing a company can do is prioritize and tell their staff, these are the three things we want to work on and only these three, three things. Because suddenly you are removing a lot of excess stuff, but companies find that really hard to make that decision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when you've got so many things to do in so many different areas, it's just like, oh my gosh, you know, what what do we need to do first? You know, I mean, do you have do you have a, a method or a recommendation for for prioritizing? Really, I do, I do. So again, you you won't be surprised. I have a lot of t- different techniques, <laughs> and a lot of them are quite fun. Uh, so one a very common one we do with companies because it's far. T- you know, we go in, and I say to I say to the bosses. How many strategic initiatives do you have? So how many strategic projects? And they'll go 100, 150. I'm like, say that back to yourself. That does not make sense. You cannot have 150 strategically important initiatives, right? Okay, so I'll get them to give me all their initiatives and all the all the data around it, like the business cases. And often what I'll do is, Rick, have you ever played Pokemon? Pokemon cards? No, no. Okay, so those who don't know Pokemon cards, they're these little, they're these little cards that have different creatures on them and each of the creatures have different scores, right? For different categories of skills, you know, so like height and strength and, and weight, you know, those of us who are older, you used to play them, they're called top trumps, but you know, they're like Pokemon cards. So what I'll do is I'll turn now 150 initiatives into Pokemon cards, right? Which will be a laminated card. It'll have the series of stats, which is crucially their data. You know, how much money will this project cost? How long will it take? How many people will be involved? Yeah, how much revenue will it bring us or whatever? And then we'll spend an hour playing Pokemon in the boardroom, right? Where you put two cards against each other. The card with the best stats wins. And you know what happens? Invariably, there'll be a bunch of cards that keep losing, right? And people will get frustrated. They'll be like, man, these cards keep losing. I've got a, you know, I've got a shitty hand. And I'll say to them, well, the easiest way to fix a shitty hand is get rid of those cards, right? Let's just get rid of them. Let's take them out of the deck, Right? And so if we play the game for an hour, we'll go from 150 projects to maybe 50. And play for another hour, we'll get down to 25. Because what we're doing is we're, we're helping them with that emotional journey of letting go of projects by just looking at them in this kind of environment. Because often a project, the only reason we're doing it is because of an emotional attachment. You know, oh, the boss told me to do it. Oh, oh this is a pet project for this person. Or it made sense three years ago or whatever. But in the cold light of day, when we look at it compared to other projects, it's not going to help us achieve as much as we are. So why not do those ones that are going to help us achieve just to a better quality? Uh, so it's stuff like that that we often help companies with to get them to prioritize better. Wow. 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 Sounds like fun. Sounds like fun. Now, um, a lot of, you know, I, th- I think one of the things that's going through my mind, um, you know, while you're talking about this is it sounds like, you know, like, you know, enterprise or larger companies. How does this, how does all of this, I mean, it's very applicable, you know, um, obviously. Um, how do you bring this down to a company that's, you know, 5, 10, 20 people? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, it's a great question, right? With the big companies, a lot of it is around the culture um, and, and trying to overcome that uh, to get strategy to work. In the small companies, they usually have an amazing culture. You know, everyone knows everyone. They all, they all get a, their problem is that one of prioritization. They don't have enough bodies to do all the things they want to do. Um, so then it is, the fo- the focus is on on really, you know, what are those few things we're going to do? And for small companies, it's as much about making active choices of what we're not going to do and celebrating that, right? A lot of them go, you know, you go, well, you can't, you can't do a new marketing campaign at the same time you're building a new product, at the same time you're onboarding 10 new staff. That's just stretching you five too much. So which one is going to get the most? And that's where the emotional intelligence comes in. You know, you know, what does each member of that group, what is their preference? Why are they, why are they emotionally attached to that? What can we, 
how can we uh, change their perspective or, or work with them so that there is a common agreement? Or even if they feel like they've they've given up on what they think is important, how can you give them assurances that, you know, in the next six months, we'll focus on what they're important? Yeah. So it's about that getting that those agreements in the team and, and doing it in a way that everyone is bought in. Because the worst thing for that with those five people is they walk out and they still each have a different view, you know, because then secretly one guy will still work on the, the thing that you all said that you're going to stop doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, in, uh, I'm going back to, you know, the, the innovation stage. And yeah. um, I, I, don't, I don't recall who, who it was, but um, there, was, there was an author that talked about the idea of being very, very transparent, you know, with your team. What I'm thinking um, at the end of the day, at the end of my thought, is that, you know, the more information we give uh, our team members, you know, again, looking at a smaller company, the more able they are to help with this ideating process. What what are your what are your thoughts on transparency? How far do you go? I mean, I know there's a comfort level, you know, that we as you know founders entrepreneurs have, but you know, what is what is what is going to make sense so that we can be most we can get the most productivity, the best idea, you know, out of our team members? Well, so I'm I'm massive proponent of transparency, right? Um, you know, I love cultures like in Finland, everyone can find out everyone else's salary. Right, their tax return from the year before, right? Uh, yeah, and I think in the companies, the more transparent. And I'll hear this again, time and again, like all oh, the same things that people don't need to know. Well, if there is, then the, the, why do you set up the company that way? You know, you, you need to look anyway. But I'm a big fan. But equally, we shouldn't live in a world where everything is just 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 chucked downwards, right? Imagine if every every report for the CEO just gets shuffled down. While that's great on the transparency front, that's a massive overload, right? So what I what I tell leaders is, great leaders is about partly is about great communication, and great communication is that simplifying messages and picking on behalf of the listener the important things that they need to get, right? So while I'm all for share the full report, can you condense it into three bullets, right? And that's what great communication is. Now when I work with people. We all over communicate, generally, unless you're from certain cultures. But we generally use too many words. We talk to too much of a level of detail that is unnecessary for the other person. So a lot of when I work with leaders or people in this space, it's about cutting back. Right? And people find that really hard. It's the old Mark Twain quote. I wrote you a long letter because I didn't have time to write you a short letter. It is way harder to communicate less than more. Yeah, I, I have a friend. I was teaching the um, uh, TLDR um, technique uh, TLDR, for like some exactly. email. That... <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's it's it. like it's great. It's great information, but it's 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 too much. I I, I too... can understand that. Yeah, I have, I've I when I used to work well, and still when I used to work with when I used to have uh, team members report to me, and they'd give me a report or they'd give me a bunch of information, uh, you know, slides or something, and they'd say, "Oh, I want you to review." It. And I said, "Before I review it." Right, I'm going to charge you ten thousand dollars per word you've put on this in this presentation. Right, so do you want a chance to to save yourself some money and edit it before I review it? And they will always take it back. And do you know what? It usually comes back with fifty percent less words. <laughs> but it's that simple that. technique of: Are you actually thinking about how much you're putting down on the page? Yeah, or are you just lazily writing everything in your brain? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Hey, um, have you ever used, um, so, uh, like, uh, with, um, we were talking about like the ideating, um, stage, have you ever used or thought about using like, uh, um, like AI or chat GPT or something like that in order to help, you know, condense that information? Yeah, I, I use it both to condense, but also to generate ideas, right? So a lot of, uh, let me just explain a lot of the senior executives that I work with have never used chat GPT and are nervous of it. So what I'll often do in the ideation phase is say to them, okay, today there's six of you. Person A, you, you, we're not going to hear your views or your ideas. You're going to be the person controlling chat GPT. So you're going to type in the same question I ask you and would expect you to generate, but you're going to use chat GPT as your proxy. Okay. And the whole point is to get them comfortable with it because then the next meeting, person B will be the person who uses chat GPT or round two and then round three, right? But also the other thing it's doing is adding new ideas into the group. So if I said, you know, what, you know, what would be a new 
flavor of uh, cereal that we could launch, right? Five people would be generating their own ideas. The sixth person would be chat GPT. And then, right? And so, uh, so that's a great way. And then, like you said, you can put in a whole bunch of ideas um, uh, and get it to look for themes or get it to enhance the ideas. So I've used that, you know, so often, often, let's say the team would come up with 50 ideas. I'd get to, to look uh, for, for patterns, something I would have done in the past, right? Or tried to group those things. And then, you know, when you rattle it down to five, I often give it to ChatGPT and say, what would be a, a build on any of the, each of these five ideas? So it's doing another wave of ideation on top, but using the impetus of the ideas the group already come up with. Cool, cool. I love it. I love it. And what about the uh, the emotional intelligence part? You know, I've I've seen. I, I talked to a guy that was. Um, I think he uh, negotiate. Uh, he was teaching people how to use uh, Chat GPT with uh, real estate negotiations. You know, and and they went through the process of managing uh, different objectives. And um, anyway. Um, <laughs> He went. He went through. He went through that process with them, and of course, you know, at the end of the day, they would go to you know whatever deal, and they had some. Inf- they're going empowered. So, you know, looking at it from you know the four personality types, you know, have you ever you know looked at using ChatGPT for or something like that just to help uh, communicate the ideas and the thinking? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and two things spring to mind. What we do. So that four personality types. When I was back in the day, when I was a junior. My old boss, one of my first bosses, got me to prepare every presentation in the four different styles. It was four times as much work every night to prepare. But it, it's what taught me. It's why I can just switch between them naturally now. But it, it, you, nowadays with, with AI, you can just upload a presentation and say, produce it in the other three styles. Yeah. How would I need to rewrite it? So, for, uh, so that's a great massive technique. And then the other thing that... Uh, uh, so we're seeing more and more of is if you want to practice your own emotional intelligence, you know, often what I do is give live feedback, put people in situations with actors, role play, but you can get, you can get AI to do that. There is some cutting edge companies who have built, um, you know, responsive units where you can literally have a conversation with them. It will um, sort of um, analyze your speech and give you feedback on how emotionally intelligent you were and how good that conversation was. Um, so I was just, I was just trying one out for a, for a new company yesterday where it was practice giving John in this company feedback who, you know, he's got these terrible behaviors, but this is all about you practicing how you get feedback. And then it gives you a score and gives you feedback on your feedback. And it was amazing, right? It felt like I was talking to an actor almost. Um, so I think there are big strides that are going to be made here that will help us all with our emotional intelligence. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I guess in the, in the in the final um, area, I know, I know for me, you know uh, that that focus conversation is is something that is, um, I, I I struggle with it. You know, you say, you know, okay, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write this paper, I'm going to do this research. Oh, but let me check these emails. Oh, I got chat. I got this that. You know, but I mean, in the reality, though, you know, I've got you know my project tasks I have to do. I do have my emails I need to respond to. I do have you know my other administrative stuff that I need to manage. I mean, how how do we leverage? What's a good tool or tools, you know, that can help, um, you know, with managing time? If I were to look at my calendar, I would say, okay, I need to schedule for two weeks out, you know, yeah. so I can make sure I'm getting all my work done, et cetera, et cetera. Have you seen anything or run any run into anything? I mean, then there, there's so many tools out there, right? But a tool is only good as the intention. Right, right, yeah. You can have an amazing tool, you just never use it. Right, uh, it's like it's. I the analogy I always give people is: how many of us have a gym membership but never go to the gym? Right, <laughs> yeah. You can you can have the you can have all the kit, but it's about that. It starts with the mindset of I'm going to commit to this. This is important, and that's why it helps sort of rationalizing because you can't commit to loads of things. Right, you can't learn a language, lose weight, uh, you know, um, make new friends. Yeah, play sports all at the, all at the same time, right? Your brain's going to just be overloaded and you quit on some of them. But you can if you just pick one of those and go, do you know what, this month, it's all about learning Spanish, right? I'm going all in, all right? So so a lot of it comes before you even engage the tool. And then obviously use a tool to enhance you. And, and yeah, there's loads of, if it's simple project management, there's loads of great project management tools, right? Literally like scheduling, time blocking, um. You know, and I always say keep it simple. I still use just my Outlook calendar, right? It's color coded. I break things into blocks. 
right? And no longer, I try and minimize multitasking. So things like emails, I'll do emails once a day. I'll batch it, right? So, and I block, I, I segment my week into one of six activities, right? And it's made me much more productive. But at the start of that funnel, I limit the number of things that go into it before I put them into those buckets. So for me, it's, it goes, you know, wider than just tools. But if it is, if it's all about tools, yeah, sure, can 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 send over a bunch of recommendations. Cool, and yeah. Yeah, I, I use, uh, I do use uh, like time blocking, you know, so I know, you know, Monday through Friday, you know, generally what I'm going to be doing. Um, just curious if there was something like I've got, you know, client time broken out, you know, and it's like, okay, I need to dedicate, you know, 25 hours in a 20 hour block, um, you know, and, and, you know, just prioritizing. I mean, I, I know I can imagine that that's something that a lot of people struggle with, you know, just if you're, you know, regardless of your role, I mean, if you're a founder, if you're, you know, you know, running a much, much larger company, I mean, there's, there's, you know, going back to prioritizing, you know, and, and putting the proper amount of weight and time and that sort of thing into, into the work that needs to be done. I mean, this is, I, th- I think when, I don't, I don't know if, if it's, you know, when that nut is cracked, you know, really, I mean, I, I can just imagine being, you know, much more productive because, you know, my focus time is my focus time and I'm getting that, you know, one thing done that needs to be done, you know, right now, you know, and, and, and seeing it through, um, you know, and then I, th- I think the other piece to that is, you know, setting expectations with my team. You know, so they know it's like, Hey, you know what Rick is, you know, out of, you know, he's working on blah, blah, blah from one to three or, or something like that. Yeah. 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 Communication and expectations of a very important part of it. Yeah. Um, but you know, just that first part of the prioritization, you know, it's, uh, it, it is a, a lot of the reasons we do too much is we don't know what we should be doing. Right? We have a goal in mind, like, you know, let's say I want to lose weight. Right. We'll try a little bit of a, we'll try a little bit, we commit ourselves like, Oh, to do this, I've got to do these 10 things. But what it's, what it's also an indication of is I haven't really understood what is going to be the single biggest thing that's going to help me lose weight. Right? I need to spend more time thinking this through and really committing to that thing. You know, and I often say to people, it's like the old, there's a, there's a great quote by Albert Einstein where he said, look, if ever I was faced with a problem, right? And I only had an hour to solve it. I would spend 55 minutes working out what the hell the problem is because then it's easy. But too many people spend 55 minutes just doing stuff, right? So spend more time breaking down your problem, really going. And the question I ask people, companies is, if you only had an hour left, what what, what activity would you do to hit your goal? Oh, well, we'd do this. Well, that's clearly your priority, right? So spend more time this week doing that. Okay? But it, having that clarity on what is the one activity you should be doing above all else is really hard because we don't really have got under the surface of our problem. Is is there a way or a method to, to really, you know, kind of boil that down? Kind of, you know, I, I love the po- the Pokemon card um, analogy. Um, yeah. But is is there a way to do that on a, on a personal level and really start shedding some of those things that, um, you know, may be more distraction than, than productive or maybe lower priority than, um, than other things? Yeah, I mean, uh, so the Pokemon thing works because it has data. So if you want to apply it in your own personal life, you have to start gathering some data rather than just going, it's a bit like that guy who thought he was only talking 10% of the time, but 70%. You have to be honest with yourself, right? You somehow have to measure, how much time am I looking at my phone? How much time am I doing all these things? So it starts with there. Because when you look at it, you'll be like, damn, man, right? Is that actually helping me get to where I want to go? No. No, 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 no. Right? It's the same. Start counting. Start counting how much food you eat during the day. How many? How much time? How many times you actually ring your mum? Right? I bet you it doesn't match to the, what you tell your brain. Your brain tells you, like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We do go to the gym enough. We do, you know, we do sleep enough. Data, data, data is 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 your and you can't data can't cheat. I mean, you can manipulate data, but data just tells you how it is, right? Okay. Um. So it starts there, right? And then it's that assessment against whatever your goal is. Is is the amount of time I'm spending here really helping? Okay, if not, what am I? How am I going to start closing this down? Right, and for different people, that last step requires different techniques because we all, we are, some of us get motivated, but just by you know, I'm going to ring somebody up and tell them that I'm no longer going to do this activity, and they're going to hold me accountable. Other people, 
It's, uh, you know, they reward themselves for not doing it. You know, so it's whatever, however motivates your own brain, you're going to have to apply that step as the last bit. I like that. I like that. Yeah, it's uh, funny. I use a, uh, a tool called uh, MemTime, and it just okay. like kind of tracks what I'm doing throughout the day. <laughs> yeah. And my beliefs in reality. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, a little yeah, bit yeah, different. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's the- yeah. It's always fascinating. You're like, oh yeah. yeah. Uh, it's like it's like all the step counters nowadays and the sleep counters trackers. Uh, there's a reason a lot of people just turn them off. They're like, I don't want to know the truth. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. All right, um, last question: what What is yes. the one piece of advice you would give, um, you know, founders, owners, business owners, CEOs that they could take and you know uh, make some wins for you know this week? Do you know what? I the piece of advice I give everybody, right? Um, it really comes back to that EQ: ask more questions and listen more. Right? Do you not believe your own height? You don't know enough about any, uh, uh, you know about an us so go and ask more questions and listen more i like that the um emotion the i think the one thing uh the one question i didn't ask about uh eq was uh you know kind of the the, the ego factor and you kind ca- you kind of spoke to <laughs> cool man well thank you so much I, I i really enjoyed our conversation i look forward to speaking to you some more in the future and folks Uh, Thanks for watching another episode of Relentless Pursuit of Winning Podcast. We'll see you next time.